welcome back to hopefully what is uh, a, sec a very interesting second round. So we are moving uh, into uh, speaking about the Czech presidency on the priorities. And uh, the next speaker we have is a keynote conversation with uh, Ivan Bartosz, the Deputy Prime Minister of Czech Republic. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to sit here and I think I'm looking you in the eyes right now. Welcome and thank you so much for spending the time with us. Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for the invitation for Digital Europe Summer Summit. Thank you so much and uh, not least thank you for hosting us, us also in Prague. We, uh, we had the privilege of uh, visiting you and your office and uh, having some discussions on digital and um, since that we have also, also seen that you have launched a new plan for really boost the digital innovation of, uh, of uh, the Czech Republic and uh, the SME growth and uh, that really has a huge potential of, uh, of growth and creating an ecosystem in the Czech Republic. And um, you, uh, you, uh, you have really been active, you were working very closely with our member also Avid uh, on, uh, on how to create a vivid uh, ecosystem of, of innovation in Czech Republic. Um, we have seen, uh, we have seen uh, quite some changes also in the way that Eastern Europe has looked upon digital investment uh, since the unfortunate and uh, illegal in, um, um, invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, by Russia. So, so let me ask you the first question. Um, the Ukrainian, they have called it the first world cyber war. Um, and what do you think that countries like Czech Republic and in Europe in general has learned about cybersecurity uh, since this terrible happening uh, in Ukraine? Uh, let, me, let me divide my answer into two parts, right? Uh, we found out during the COVID crisis how important it is for us to actually boost the digitalization by itself. And it showed us how important cooperation is within the European Union, with our partners abroad, but as well within the nation combining a common strategy that's applicable for business, uh, for NGOs, for scientific field and academics, and, and for the government. And I think that experience that we got is something that we pass to the situation that's emerging in Europe because of Russian war on Ukraine. And we have to think of it that way, that the close cooperation between the nations and with a broad uh, cooperation between transatlantic and also involvement of all those parts of society are significant to deal with digitalization itself, but also with the cybersecurity. When on the European level, we are able to share knowledge, give it a framework that's applicable for individual countries, but as well, uh, promote that to our partners and learn from the private sector. Because as far as my experience is, and I used to work with IT for 20 years, even though I did politics at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a private sector that's bringing like the toughest, you know, software, the experience uh, from, from the real world. And there is a lot of to be learned from, from the governments of the individual countries. And I'm happy that even through our visit, but also D9 Plus in Prague, everybody understands that the cooperation is significant. And it was also business sector uh, in Czech Republic, but in other countries, well, Ukraine have a direct aid, not talking about the military equipment, but with the ICT equipment, Starlink uh, satellite connections, servers, and also of hosting services of the Ukrainian government when they appear to be under Russia cyber attacks. Thank you so much. And uh, I mean, we, you also have a situation, I know that's a little bit um, uh, <coughs> off, uh, off, uh, off track on the questions, but I know that Czech Republic is also one of the countries that are quite hit by the energy crisis. Do you see, you know, digital innovation being uh, part of that solution also? Uh, I believe, yeah, because uh, all of them devices that we considered uh, as a solution to the, to the energy crisis, solars, 
uh, heating systems, right? Uh, technology that works with the hydrogen, or let's say smart grids concerning uh, uh, the houses that are working somehow either neutral or they are modular. Everything is driven by IT, it's driven by the chips. So that's why, for example, Chip Act is an important part of the European legislation process, because we have to think of a of a, on one hand, you know, supply chains in, a, in chains in the digital, but also of what we can offer to each other within within the euro. So yeah, digitalization is a significant plays a significant part uh, to solving the energy crisis as well. Anyway, all the measures and calculations are made through the through the systems, right? So the efficiency is one key. To solving the solving the uh, the crisis with energies as well. Thank you so much. So, uh, turning a little bit to the regulatory agendas, right? I mean. Uh, Many companies have seen a huge increase of regulatory files coming from the EU. I can tell you, you know, that an organization like Digital Europe, uh, we had only half the amount of files that we were working on uh, just two or three years ago. So under your presidency, you will have the Data Governance Act, you will have the AI Act. You know, how do you see what are the priorities on these regulatory issues during the presidency and what will be important for you to uh, to either pass or to discuss during the presidency? Uh, it's not a cliche for me that the role of the presidential country should be honest broke, which could be explained from the from the point of view of individual states of European Union when we are trying to achieve a common agreement on that or within the trilogues or within the dialogue with the European Commission. But on the other hand, and I like that, uh, that expression of open strategic autonomy, which says, right, we want to have things that uh, protect the citizen on one hand, but also not slow down the evolution that's in digital. And uh, you mentioned there is a lot of legislation, right, but the evolution, especially in digital, but also in other technologies, went in last years of a rapid speed. So, you know, the time when we are talking about the cookies and, and it's still it's on the place. Now we are talking about use of quantum computing, about the cloud system, when the data will be stored. We are talking artificial intelligence very seriously. So there is, of course, a missing part of the framework. And with a lot of files, that passed through recently DSA, DMA, we were trying to somehow put rules into the world that already evolved. But in many cases, there are, there are challenges in front of us and we have to be careful, right? On one hand, you know, to, uh, to keep the security, uh, think of a person and its individual data, but on the other hand, you know, not to stop uh, research on the data or commercial aspect of the data usage. So that's, that's, that's the way how I understand from the political point of view of to be an honest broker. But on the other hand, of course, how it's going to be balanced thinking of Europe and the rest of the world and also involvement of the cutting edge technology that usually doesn't come from the, from the scientific research driven by the government. It usually comes from everyday business uh, and of knowledge the customers. So, so that's the balance I'm looking for. And when we talk about priorities, uh, there, of course, and I already mentioned that, is an is a artificial intelligence case uh, when we want to uh, find the general approach on that, which means include, and there are very tricky topics, and I discussed that, for example, with Finland. We are pretty far with the artificial intelligence implementation of the classification of the system. What is and what is not AI? Right, if something is just a smart algorithm. Also, the classification of a potential danger of the system is in place, and it won't be easy task to do, but there are limits you don't want to go uh, uh, behind them, right? Which uh, could lead to abuse of the artificial intelligence in the public space. So, those are the things that we are putting on the table, and we will try to get it as far as we can. I mentioned general approach, but the same ambition we have at the EID which is very important and evil, it, not only for us, but even the Czech Prime Minister Petr Fiala has got it, it's all the priorities. And there are many others, Digital Decade Policy Program, 
digital own, uh, pardon me, declaration on the digital rights, etc. So we we've got it balanced. We don't. Uh, we've got few priorities of that we can reach specific and significant uh, progress in that. But anyway, all them files are on the table, and we will try to push them as far as we can. During our presidency, the role won't be that, uh, let's say, active, and I understand that, but you don't do a European uh, legislation process only during the presidency, right? So I believe with the new government, and we've got a lot of people involved in the digitalization, that's gonna be the agenda the Czech Republic will participate actively after the presidency is over, then Sweden and then Spain will take, and that's a new standard for us as long as we've got a chance to actually influence it. So, um, last but not least, I mean, I think we can all say that the Russian aggression has really uh, strengthened the transatlantic alliance. Um, and is it more, is it better now? Is it a time that we talk less about European sovereignty and more about um, transatlantic uh, collaboration and digital front? Um, you uh, you will be hosting also, or you will be dealing with with a new uh, TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, where you have US and uh, and EU working together on these uh, technology issues. Um, what are your goals there, and what do you hope to achieve? Uh, I don't want to get too much in politics, even though I'm a politician, but I believe because of the change of administration and of course under the pressure that uh, came out of COVID but also with the, with the Ukrainian crisis and with Russia war, uh, the transatlantic cooperation would get stronger and it's important uh, because we are the Western world and uh, we don't have much information coming from uh, the negotiations from TTC so I uh, even asked European Commission during our last uh, meetings that we've got with the council uh, in Luxembourg, that we, we wanna have some guidelines and our business partners as well, because we do it together. Let's say what we should expect. Uh, when I follow the historical, you know, relation Europe and, uh, and America or United States, you know, we had pro problems with the safe harbor. We are addressing the data flows that are that are under the under the sea, and those are the things that we should solve. Uh, Europe, <coughs> Europe with its specific position, and I understand the role that we are. <coughs> uh, I wouldn't say surrounded, but uh, considering Russia, we are almost neighbors, right? We do have a problems with the historical uh, with the historical influence of the strong neighbor, which Russia is, and many countries. So obviously we are looking for the partners and the future will be more significant in the Western world. But one of them roles we want to play within our presidency is not to distinguish that much between Europe and the other countries who are on the same side in digitalization, you know, representing our approach to the human rights, to the rule of law. So I would like to uh, handle the presidency and that's what Prime Minister said as well, as an open. We are discussing Western Balkan. We are discussing and going step by step in cooperation with uh, with America, not only through TTC, but also on an everyday basis, because a lot of companies are presented in European countries, and we strongly cooperate, uh, even with the e-government agenda through public procurement. So uh, my suggestion is, you know, that any any open platform that would bring us uh, together and, and and deliver results that are useful either in science or with development of a of a I, I, pardon me ICD it's important so like do not close doors because we've got maybe different opinions on specific standards and uh, as long as we can find a common ground you know to the specific level I think there is no big difference between between EU and America considering the development of IT technology or the digitalization itself. Okay, maybe one uh, one one question on uh, this chips short shortage. So, I mean, <coughs> what role do you think that government should have in addressing the the supply chain issues that we have now? And uh, I mean, how do you see that advancing also during your presidency? 
you see, government responsibility to its nation is to provide, right? To provide to the people. On the other hand, you've got entire business segment, and it showed us even through the COVID how something that we rely on, you will have always, let's say, uh, cheap or accessible technology into cars, you know, not only into what we consider the uh, IT tools, computers, smartphones, you know, couldn't be, uh, or it showed to us that it's not granted. So we have to look for the ways to actually provide specific technology constantly because so many things are dependent on it. And we were talking historically about the Internet of Things and about smart devices uh, within the households. But like almost everything right now that we use that somehow help us, it's a smart device that requires specific technology. What I believe as well, there is an important part about, and we discussed that with the even the involvement of the Chinese technology in the building 5Gs and uh, with all them telecommunication technologies, we have to also think security, which means there has to be a way how you can at least supervise how the chips are created, put it alive, what's uploaded in there. So so let, let's go that way. And uh, I think uh, and uh, during the COVID, it showed us how it's hard even to you know, transport things from state to another state, and we were neighbors, right? And now you are talking about shipments, you are talking about aviatic transportation or something. So we have to think again there, and it's not like you replace with the global options, you replace it with some homemade or European made thing, but still the resilience is important. So the dependencies could be uh, could be done by natural cooperation, but it could be broken by something like the viruses, something like just that happened with the with the food out of other support, just a blockade of a port, and that's got direct dependency not only to Europe, maybe to states, but also to African countries. So let's think about the global world, but also you know think of what if something change? Are we self-sufficient? You know, could we provide to people something that they are used to or something that's really necessary for like, let's say, even innovations, right? Because uh, uh, you just need you, you just need the ICT equipment in order to pass by uh, to grow. So that's an important thing. I, I believe that Europe and America could work in that uh, very closely, uh, such as in other, other particular, particular things uh, which uh, could be considered a defense. And we are members of the NATO as well. So it's not only just one platform we are dealing with, for example, security or with the resilience, which was historically mainly the word used by the military uh, and by the NATO, um, and NATO members when we discuss something. But obviously, resilience is something that's, uh, that's common to almost any field that you, that you do your policy or you think of a society. So um, one last question, and then I will turn to the audience. So please, if you have really good questions, uh, think about them uh, now. So one last question for me. So you've just launched a really big plan on investment that's going to benefit SMEs and, and digital SMEs in, in Czech Republic. So if you look like four years down, uh, down the road, what is it that they hope to achieve? And uh, do you have specific areas of investment where you think Czech Republic or even Europe have a special interest in really boosting their digital resilience or the digital innovation? You see, and that's going to be answer that's got completely nothing to do with the technology because it's an education to work with the technology. I believe we got to, and it, it involves SMEs as well. One of them is a, just a technological upgrade, right? And historically, it was always like, if you do a big things, you have to do it with big partners. So it was historically then the subsidies or like cooperation was always like between big and government. I, I want to have it that open to like real, you know, not unicorns, but to the companies who are just like cutting edge. And we want to get to that specific level, uh, almost any kind of industry because then it saves help, it sends, it sends time, it saves money, 
and it can really you know be progressive in the matter of this all environmental and digital transformation but the important thing is we do even though we've got skills within this society and i look at the figures not only of a czech republic but the eu countries that let's say shift from the information society level to the knowledge society to them to have people who can you know distinguish between information and disinformation that you've got adjusted syllabus and significant amount of money in that national recovery plan which is derived from resilience plan of the eu goes to the education goes to the, goes to universities of changing their syllabus open new classes right start innovation hubs where business uh, business uh, uh, academics you know ngos can meet so so this is the way we have to like upskill entire society and that that will bring us the real resilience not only we can we can do uh, we can do research in the technology we can implement it in the real life but also we are resilient to potential threats which includes cybersecurity as well and if we talk about you know there is not sufficient number of uh, IT experts within the government offices in the society if there is something even less than are the experts that are concerned and they are educated in cybersecurity so if this is a topic and it's important topic which uh, the war on ukraine showed to us we would have to also focus on that specific area of it which is on one side let's say the technical skills to actually build the components but on the other hand it's like who's going to be the one who work for socs um, we do have covered that pretty much for the business sector but not always but we have to think of that in the future so we do have a educated society that's resilient uh, towards this information who is responsible online and the more we go digital the more fragile considering those things the society is so uh, that's the thing to invest invest to the people and that will bring you benefits even in the technology yeah, no, I think uh, one thing you just said, you said resilience uh, through uh, skilling the population and having the right experts. Um, right now, at the moment, we are missing around 300,000 cybersecurity specialists in, uh, in Europe, and this is maybe the biggest threat that we actually have. Um, and uh, another one is, of course, that um, some solutions are still not using cloud and not being connected to some of the most safe and secure um, clouds in the world can actually uh, create great vulnerabilities. We saw it in WannaCry where the hospitals were attacked uh, with non-connected and non-updated uh, IT devices. So, so resilience through skills, I think it's something that we are waking up to now. We've been talking about digital skills for how long? I think 25 years. And still somehow we can fly to the moon, but we can't seem to get that run right. So how do we actually do this? And, and uh, just to mention Digital Europe actually just educated and re-educated uh, 700 women uh, from administrative functions into cybersecurity and software specialists. The majority is right now in a job working exactly with that. Um, so definitely also an area where I think um, uh, that we as an industry have a huge role to play. So let's see if we have uh, many, many more questions, but if we turn to the audience, if we would have any questions from the audience, please, the gentleman there. Um, good afternoon, Matthew Newman uh, from MLEX. Um, you mentioned uh, the digital identification and also like um, whether or not you thought it was a priority. Um, just wanted to check if you think there might be a, a general approach on the digital uh, identity. And a, and a pretty technical question regarding that, but since we're all technical experts here, um, it has to do with um, the certification of uh, websites. So there is some controversy about whether or not the proposal, the Commission's proposal, would have an obligation for websites to accept certain kinds of um, EU approved um, certifications for websites. And uh, tech companies, um, some of the, the big search engines, 
um, were opposed to this because they want to have control over this for cybersecurity reasons. They think that it's, uh, they should be doing the vetting of these websites. I wanted to see if you have any um, views on that um, and check if, you know, in the as presidency, if you'll be able to steer this through by uh, December. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more question from the audience, just behind the gentleman behind. Hi, um, Lucas Zanderman from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Uh, my question is actually about cybersecurity and SMEs, in a sense that we know that cybercrime, in particular ransomwares, is disproportionately and like underreported, and this affects particularly SMEs because they fear, in the case of a cyber attack, reputational damages, or they estimate that paying the ransomware will cost less than, you know, for example, stopping uh, like the operation of their companies. So. In many ways, like, do you have strategies to sort of foster a cultural change? Because if we don't have reliable data about the extent of cyber attacks, we can't really formulate a strategy. So if you have any proposals particularly targeted at SMEs to foster this, this like, cultural change and essentially encourage reporting in, in, those, in the cases of those cyber attacks, thank you. Thank you so much. Two very difficult questions, I believe. So one is on uh, the certification and vetting of uh, website security. And it, it, maybe the, the answer will be uh, ask one of the specialists, or maybe the, the minister actually knows. And the, the, the second is, what's the strategy? How do we actually improve the resilience of SMEs or the, the cultural change in the SME environment being in an SME uh, continent, making sure that they report and ask for help? Uh, for their cybersecurity attack. Is there a government strategy? Is there <coughs> a strategy in place for that? So, I will try to answer both questions. I'm not aware of particular use case, right? But, but as far as I understand, uh, and that's one of the open questions that are actually coming from Netherlands, I believe, is What's gonna happen if we've got a universal European ID and EvoLab with the national, national certified, national provided, um, pro provided EIDs? <coughs> the same thing is, and we know it from everyday life, right? I'm using uh, EvoLab on specific, ser specific services that I'm using to identify myself, not only within the platform that provides that ID, but also in the cross platform. Like you can sign with the specific ID to the service of another. So, so I don't know if there is a particular misunderstanding on that matter, or if there is something that's coming from the business. The other thing that I'm facing in is how the how the data of the EID would be stored. It's more of a technical thing, and we see many use cases how it's resolved through, let's say, blockchain calculation. So there is also a problem with the persisting storage. But I'm not aware there should be, uh, there should be some, let's say, disagreement on the level of, but I, I'm happy to read that, on the level of individual website and web services, what kind of, what kind of identification they would use, if it's like of an age that, or it's accessible to registered people. So, so you know, just from top of the head, I, I don't actually, I cannot answer that specific question to the end of the individual website and how the European ID or whatever ID would behave in that specific case. And when we are talking about or the second question about the SMEs, uh, and I remember that moment, specifically in the history, when security of the data and uh, uh, of, uh, of the customer data started to be a point of difference if you uh, choose between two commercial services. So it started to be like, and we don't provide data or we've got special security features. Uh, so your data won't be stolen. And it became a market, not only marketing, but uh, the real advantage of, uh, of choosing that particular service. And uh, some of companies actually start to believe we do safe software. We, we don't, we are resistance to, the, to their cyber attacks, but uh, I'm a user of many platforms and sometimes it just happens that the, that the company is compromised 
and it's a huge worldwide company, right? What the data is stored. The thing is, and it happened historically, and maybe sometimes it's still happening, that the security of the data is underestimated not only of thinking, but also of the money that you spend on the solution. So basically, first it's lead by example when you deliver governmental solution to something, it's got to be safe, you know, and let's say cyber, cyber protective against stealing the data, especially healthcare data, but also the others. The other thing is, so, so you got to lead by example. The other thing is, even with designing things for the government, it's going to be secure by default. So it was always like you need time to market solution because it's a Christmas time, because it's, I don't know, a traveling season and you want to offer some feature or the application on the telephone as fast as you can because you are competing with so many people. So we have to push that again through the education, go security by design at the very beginning. And uh, there is slight disbalance of how the companies are actually treated uh, if, if they do something that's, for example, not confirmed uh, to GDPR or other regulations, but uh, then the state's being somehow soft to its own uh, public uh, public institution. So you have to measure both same, right? So if someone steals the data of the capital city citizens, I think it's a big issue. It's the same way if, if data of particular service is stolen or compromised. And uh, that, that, that's how I understand that. So uh, when I talk about the upskill, it has to be upskill or so for how you deal with the data. If the solution that you provide to the markets got at least, you know, a specific level of, uh, let's say, authorization, but it's also, you know, ran through let's say, uh, test against whatever attacks are currently currently known in the market. And uh, even if you go on a subsidy level, and it was mentioned, uh, it was mentioned uh, by, uh, by a general director before, uh, the money that goes to the SME support in the digital transformation should have the, the security and cyber sec within. Sometimes it's over technology, where you run your services, you know, what technology you are using. But uh, in many cases, it's about, do you, have a, do you have a specialist within your team that, you know, is aware of legislation and of the real, uh, real life threats? Uh, and, uh, and the companies should have a place to ask for help. I'm not sure if it's gonna be, let's say, governmental institution, but uh, obviously, since we are talking about SMEs and smaller companies, uh, the security as SOC uh, provided, uh, it doesn't cost that much money comparing the risk that completely like destroys the name of the company if something happens in that particular matter. Thank you so much for, for the comprehensive um, answer. One last question from my side. So um, I think that long companies have been calling for a closer collaboration between private sector and public sector in cybersecurity. I've heard uh, through the grapevines that there are countries, especially Eastern European countries, that wants to bring forward during the Czech uh, presidency some kind of new governance model for how to work with private sector and how to work even closer on cybersecurity. We have GD Connects now looking at how to uh, really build a new cybersecurity center. Is this summer, I mean, is, is, is the Czech presidency going to be like the presidency that carries these kind of new developments of of a closer collaboration of a both with uh, within EU and within private sector and public sector forward is this like one of your goals for the presidency uh, there is a little bit politics behind that always right and uh, there are uh, attempts right that uh, the cyber security is not uh, it's common for sure for european countries because we cooperate in so many levels right it's one thing on the other hand and the cyber security is a responsibility of the country and uh, so there was an idea let's build you know a few 
uh, uh, European uh, security centers and somehow, you know, even share responsibility. But it's 27 individual states. Uh, you cannot framework them, right? A lot of the data is really government data pro protected, you know, by the government. So in that particular matter, uh, I, I still believe there is a certain a certain level of what you can share of knowledge, you know, experts, frameworks, uh, which could also involve the, the private sector. And it will be because uh, there, there is nothing like a, a state agency, you know, uh, programming firewalls and programming tools or even build infrastructure. It's always a commercial sector that provides you either the knowledge or the solution, right? And uh, uh, and if we gonna do work on the tools that would be of a common use, it has to be open. It has to be open, you know, that uh, you won't just get some national solution and try to promote it as European standard because, you know, it's like we inspire each other. So I don't know if I, if I hit that, uh, that answer directly to your question. There are files, Cyber Resilience Act and the others. But of a definition of a cooperation, um, I think that there are almost no limits. Sometimes it somehow uh, leads to that uh, and you skip the public procurement. But it's also, you know, if you owe the solution as a government, uh, you cannot usually go uh, the way uh, government to business directly. There are national rules, there are European legislation, how the solution uh, shall be. Uh, shall be competed on the market, you know, what would be the solution or deliverance of the private sector. Uh, so I believe you just, you just said, you know, what you expect of the solution. And then it's uh, considering uh, reliable partners uh, uh, that are from the lands that we cooperate. And I always talk about, and I said it on the beginning, let's say of the Western, Western world, you know, liberal democratic countries. So one of that is a legislation and we have to understand, you know, states cannot give up, uh, give up uh, the, the national or all the security, not even because we do cooperate, but uh, because it's a matter of the, of the government. You've got the data that are touchy, they are important, they are strategic, they are business related strategic data because it's coming from cooperation of national government with the business sector. So um, we, have to, we have to have everything I just said in mind like not to disbalance it just because uh, we have a current threat, but it's not just current, it's just like more visible because the uh, cyber threat uh, threats were they always, even before the war. Now it's emphasized through the, through the hot conflict on Ukraine, uh, but rapidly, you know, changing everything because we need to address specific matter. It's not, uh, from my opinion, like a good way because you have to understand even and it's a state cooperating. Uh, if the crisis would be deeper, you know, even the democratic governments are somehow threatened if, you know, the, the crisis of Europe or crisis in the world would go deeper. Uh, it would just move masses. It could be used by populists. It could be used by the regimes that, you know, uh, don't feel that the freedom and security and the privacy are also important for solving uh, difficulties that the, that, the, that the country or Europe or the world is going through. Okay, thank you so much. I can tell you that we have almost 600 people online listening. Thank you so much to all of you out there and of course to the people in the room. So I would say my takeaways is a dynamic Czech uh, presidency with a strong uh, transatlantic uh, agenda and openness uh, with uh, cyber security and of course the energy transformation uh, at the heart but also of course as a true broker towards the files of the data governance act and the ai uh, act in uh, during your presidency um, i also hear it's difficult to uh, to uh, to totally build out the national aspect of the cyber security governance of the future but let me remind everyone that cyber attacks doesn't really care about borders. They don't care about private sector or public sector. And that we, as you said, uh, Minister, we are quite vulnerable because we are, do not have the skills to protect ourselves. And as you said, this should be one of our absolute prime focuses is to actually get the right skills on ground to make sure 
that our citizens and our companies are uh, protected, and a strong SME investment strategy to boost innovation uh, in Czech Republic and hopefully also in the rest of Europe. I want to thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership, and we're looking very much forward working with you during your presidency and, of course, before and after. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming here. And thank you for invitation. Have a nice day.